was one climber who was uh, part of all three expeditions in 1921, 22, and 1924, and this was George Lee Mallory. And he was a, uh, a school teacher by trade, he loved to go climbing, and he realized that Everest was going to be his big uh, goal and what he really wanted to go to. And so he set out to, um, to, uh, to, to make this his, his goal and his landmark of what he wanted to do. And he embarked on the first trip in 1921 as a, um, as a younger climber and, and um, was under the, the direction of uh, Mr. Bruce, and then they went on um, to come back in 1922. And at the time, climbing, as you can see, was a pretty new sport. A lot of the equipment that we now take for granted and the techniques of, um, of diet and how much water to drink and things like that were really pretty much unknown. People really didn't know how the body would respond to altitude. The best information that people had was from going up in hot air balloons in a wicker basket and taking notes till they blacked out, and they knew that <laughs> altitude was dangerous, and that was the best that they had there, so they had to come back and look at it in a different way. You can see here in the uh, 1922 expedition, Mallory on the lower left-hand side of the picture, and in 1923, they um, reorganized, and they came back earlier in the season because they were there in 22, too late in the season, just as the monsoon came in, and the 22 trip ended tragically when um, a uh, Avalanche swept uh, seven of the Darjeeling Sherpas to their death, and so it was a very emotional part on that. It was the first of um, many expeditions where people of India and Nepal and um, the Sherpas in particular have given their lives um, for Westerners in their goal to climb mountains, and it's something that uh, is part of my life now. And they came back in 1924. You can see they were a little more confident. Mallory is uh, second from. Uh, the, the left on the top hand picture there, um, staring right into the camera. And to his right, leftmost in the picture there, is Sandy Urban, who was his chosen partner on the um, on that last uh, goal, his last climb of 1924. And Urban was um, he was younger than Mallory by 14 years. He was um, had not seen combat in World War One, and really wasn't a, a, a climber with a, a tremendous amount of skills and whatnot. Rather, he was um, really good at um, mechanical things. He was quite the engineer. When he was at Oxford, he was able to uh, redesign some uh, of the, uh, the guns that were used in aircraft. So he was a really keen thinker. And it was probably for this reason, along with his uh, strength of youth, that uh, Mallory chose him for the uh, summit theory. When we take a look here, this is they're testing the uh, the oxygen apparatus on the plains of India, or probably the plains of Tibet, prior to embarking on the climb. And take a look at this. And here they are. They've got steel cylinders with bathtub fixtures and rubber hose <laughs> onto, a, uh, onto a mask. And this is a, of course, you have to have a double-breasted jacket and a felt floor. <laughs> this is what you went to go climb Everest with in 1924. And you think about what climbers use now, and you'll see those in the images, that it's vastly different than um, what was available at that time. And again, it was pretty much unknown. People didn't know how the human body would react physiologically to this extreme altitude. And one of the things that was learned at it, they thought that snow goggles only needed to be worn when they were on the snow. If you were on the rock, you didn't need to wear them. And as any of us that have been up to altitude, you understand that even on a bright day, you want to wear your sunglasses. And so this is an instance where um, all the members that come down with snow blindness, which is a temporarily debilitating uh, feature that happens to people that don't take care of their eyes. And climbing was quite a bit different then, too. If you can take a look here, you see the, um, the ladders that they were using. This would now be climbed with crampons and ice axes going up. But this was a, a bamboo and uh, a rope ladder that went up the, um, the ice wall there, and which the porters would then have to carry their equipment up and down. And Mallory, um, here is seen climbing on the uh, Northeast Ridge with Morton, this photograph was taken. He's uh, in the forefront there. It gets you a great idea of the actual equipment they used. So their ice axes were about three feet tall. They had um, leather boots with cleats in them, sort of like a football shoe, if you will. And then they had a, an elastic woven, um, elastic woven 
whole patea around their legs to offer warmth. And then uh, many layers over their, over their rest of their body. It was estimated up to seven layers at that time to um, keep themselves warm. They went up higher onto the, um, the mountain. This is um, a photograph that was taken by Howard Somerville of Norton climbing the picture. And it's probably, let me see if I, here's a cursor. We can see the climber just about in there. And it's not the, um, you, know, you can see, see him there, his backpack, his arms reaching down, his legs there. This is a great picture. We can see the summit up to the top. This is the uh, yellow band here, and then the, the second step was obscured, and the third step would be just about there. And it's a great picture because you can get an idea of the snow conditions that were there in 1924. A lot of people think that it was a heavy snow year and they could have just walked up the mountain where the second step creates a challenge for the climbers. But from this picture and from the, um, the journals of the tea growers in Darjeeling, it was a very dry year in 1924. So they, um, Norton and Somerville turned back on the 4th of June. They gave their best effort and they were descending down and they ran into Mallory Urban at the, um, at the North Pole camp. And they then set out to, um, um, they, they sort of passed the baton on, and one of those batons, figuratively speaking, was Somerville's uh, Kodak uh, Best Pocket Camera. And it was this camera that many people believe, had they made the summit, would have proved that they made it there to the top. It would be a picture of the east face of Lodze, something that you cannot see from the Tibet side of the mountain, only if you're on the summit of the peak. So they, they went on, and um, his support was Nolo Dell, which is, I was feel honored to know that he um, spoke here for, at the Himalayan Club uh, some, on the 50th anniversary, so 32 years ago. And he was a, um, a very wonderful man from uh, what I've read of him. And at the time, they didn't have radios, which is what climbers communicate with now back and forth on, on the mountains. So they would write notes and leave them on the, um, on the paper, uh, leave the paper notes in the tent. And he comments in here, he goes, Dear Noel, we'll probably start early tomorrow, the 8th, in order to have clear weather. It won't be too early to start looking for us, either crossing the rock band under the pyramid or going up strong at 8 p.m. Yours ever, Gene Mallory. And this was the last that humankind ever heard from George Mallory. It was on the 8th of June, shortly after noon, that he and Urban were enveloped in the clouds, and Noel Odell, who was with him, pointing out this picture where he had last seen them, uh, pointing out the first step. And it's interesting that just below that where his finger is, is on that um, the triangular snow field, is um, right in here, is where Mallory's final resting point is. So he was over here on this ridge, kind of obscured by his finger, looking up towards this on the ridge. And the second step is here, this is the first step, and then this is where the, um, when you exit the north ridge onto the, the northeast ridge onto the um, down onto the, the north face proper itself. We know that Everest was climbed unequivocally in uh, 1953, May, 9th, May 29th to be um, exact. And it was by Tenzing Norgay, pictured here as Fred and Hillary. And it was this wonderful moment of um, where people had this chance to uh, sort of celebrate. We had just finished the Second World War, and exploration was, um, as it is now, something that's aspirational. So people see these journeys, they're inspired by them, and they get a, a chance to, um, to um, take that back with you. And people always ask, why do you go climb? In fact, one of the gentlemen here asked me that um, as I was preparing my notes, and I, I, I had a vague answer. But when you see the smile on these two gentlemen's face, then there's a reason enough, because it brings you happiness, which is a great thing. So um, Everest um, continued to draw expeditions. And um, in 1963, the United States launched an expedition that um, climbed both the uh, South Pole route and the uh, West Ridge. And it was uh, celebrated by uh, then President John Kennedy, who um, used uh, the famous quote by Mallory to why I climb mountains, because it's there as his motivation for the next big landmark in exploration, which was the moon. And if we think about it, 1953, humans climb Everest. 1969, we land on the moon. And that's 16 years apart. 
that's not even one generation, a generation being anywhere from 20 to 25 years apart, depending on which country and their birth rates. But that's less than a generation. To make that leap from something that is very simple and understandable, which is climbing a mountain, and humans have been doing that since time uh, immemorial, to getting on a rocket and landing on the moon. And um, it was a, a pretty uh, amazing thing. And I remember at the time, I was a, a young man of seven years of age, and it was just like the coolest thing. I remember seeing it on my parents' black and white TV and getting excited and riding my bicycle around the block about 10 times. And we all did the moonwalk, which was uh, kind of lumbering around in these big suits, pretending we were walking the moon and it wasn't doing the, uh, the Michael Jackson version of that. That came in the 80s. But um, it was this very important thing that uh, really inspired um, my generation to science and, and towards an aspiration goal. And I think that's one of the main things that uh, climbing offers to people is this, this chance to push your limits and to challenge yourself. And, and when you do that, come back with um, a degree of, um, of understanding yourself a little bit better. So fast forward to uh, 1999. This was an expedition, the Mallory uh, Herman Research Expedition. It was organized by Eric Simonson on the right there and Dave Hahn as the lead climber. And with uh, about two weeks to go, I was invited on this expedition. So it was, uh, it was sort of out of the blue. And I was really excited um, because I'd never been to Everest. And I, my goal was to uh, have a go at the second step, which is a 90-foot cliff band at 28,300 feet that Mallory and Urban would have had to have summit if they made it to the top in 1924. So my goal as a technical climber, I was there on the part of the film to be the uh, to have a go at the second step without having previous knowledge of having been on Everest. So it was kind of a, um, a pretty good um, opportunity, and I was really grateful for Eric and the team for inviting me along. But we contrast with what we saw in the um, earlier uh, pictures of, uh, of what uh, Mallory was like to, in a modern day ex expedition. Pretty much everyone's wearing some form of oil, excepting the monks there in front. Um, in terms of their clothing, it's all nylon and polyester and things that are, um, so it was a, a pretty elemental shift in that. And climbing it remains the same. It's always hard work. It's always a lot of um, effort to go up and down. But at the, um, with the each subsequent ascent, each time you've been on the mountain, it makes it a little bit easier um, of what it was like um, in the previous expedition. So we were there early in the year, and on the 1st of May, we went up to um, high camp. It's at 8,000 meters, and we fanned out, and I contoured low to see what um, the elevation was like and, and sort of get acclimatized to it. And it was at this point that I came across frozen and well-preserved body of George Lee Mallory. And it was something that was, um, will be with me for the rest of my life. It was, um, it was uh, someone that um, who I had a tremendous amount of respect for as a climber because what he was able to do then, um, subsequent expeditions built their experience upon them. And it's the same way that society and humanity works in that we have this ball of knowledge, we add to it, and then the next generation picks it up and moves it forward. And I'm a firm believer in that, that the future generations who do things so much greater and bigger than we did, uh, basically they're gonna clean up our mess, but, <laughs> sorry young kids, but um, each generation does something better, and it's a really important part of, uh, of life. So we continued on, uh, summited on the 17th of May. Uh, this is my partner, Dave coming up towards the summit, and the news went around the world um, about the uh, discovery, and it was either thought as a great thing or, or we were derided as uh, grave robbers and things like that. So it was a pretty controversial point at the time. It was one that um, was um, it, it's made me become a, a better and more clear person because I have to answer a lot of questions uh, about this, and so which I don't mind. It's what my life is, and I'll, um, I'll roll with it, as they say. But uh, we brought back some of his personal effects and returned them to the family and the Royal Geographic Society in London, which had sponsored the expedition. His hobnail boots, um, really, um, compared to what people climb in now, specifically the boots designed for Mount Everest, which are very light, and they have four layers of insulation, and 
laces and all this stuff. These were leather boots with um, football cleats embedded in them. Um, it was really a far cry, no overboot or anything like that. And then uh, his watch um, was in his pocket. Um, the hands rusted in it either five minutes after 10 or 2.20, who knows? Was it because he had fallen at that time or was it become finally had it unwound? So it was um, this great mystery and one that uh, was with me and it sort of uh, changed my, where I was in, in terms of being a climber. I'd always been, I always enjoyed climbing, but I was more focused on technical stuff, sort of like climbing El Capitan or the goal of climbing Meru. And so then all of a sudden I was, uh, things had changed, but it was a good thing. So I was always very happy with it. And in the course of it though, I'd, I'd always wanted to do a tribute to George Mallory, something that was really going to be um, significant and something that would really honor the man and, and his legend and everything like that. So um, when we made the film at the time in 1999, it was more about us. It was about how we climbed the mountain and some of the experience. And fit into that was the, um, the story of Mallory, but there was never really a great biopic about the life of uh, George Mallory. And it was, um, in 2005 that uh, Anthony Geffen from the UK contacted me. He had read uh, my book um, that I co-wrote with David Roberts, The Lost Explorer. He had read it and he said, hey, let's get together and make a film. And it was a great opportunity because I got everyone from my neighbor with his high eight camera, like, let's go do it, Conrad. You and me, we're going to make the Mallory film. I've got that you now. like, George, this is great, but it's not going to happen. You're not really a climber, and I'm not a filmmaker, and we'll have a good time, but we, we could get her, but we're not going to do it. And to the big Hollywood production outfits that wanted to do a fictionalized account and to change the story and do all that, and I was really interested in a documentary that someone could pick up and watch 20 years from now and have a good idea of who Mallory was and what it was like for him to be climbing at that time. 